G'day everybody, we're back today and we are here for episode three of Building for Performance. Last episode we started to pull down our AU Tickford uh, XR6 engine and it is the single overhead cam unit and today uh, on this episode we'll be pulling the head apart and I'll be going through uh, how to measure the ports and what we need to do to make this head work for us and our basically our goals for the, the build. So without further ado, let's crack into it. So it's time for me to answer the question that I asked you last time in the last episode of uh, Building for Performance. So the question that I asked was what is better for high RPM output, a uh, short runner intake or a longer runner intake? And unsurprisingly, uh, most of the guys who watch this channel have an interest in uh, performance, so uh, a lot of them got the answer right. And uh, <coughs> to answer your question, uh, the shorter runner is generally better for higher RPM output, uh, and that is to do with two things. Uh, the first thing being uh, the reflective wave tuning, uh, which is basically when the intake valve closes, the column of air rushing down will hit the intake valve and there'll be a pressure wave or a reflection wave, whichever you want to call it, which will rush back and forth down the intake tract. And basically, this isn't a static uh, value, it's a dynamic thing which will slide and it will change with RPM, uh, but a shorter intake runner will generally benefit uh, a higher RPM power band. Um, the other thing is that a longer runner promotes more intake charge velocity, and intake charge velocity uh, is better for filling the cylinder at low RPM. At some point, the longer pipe will restrict airflow uh, and will no longer be as efficient for higher RPM. Think of it like sucking through a long straw. Uh, you, you can only get so much through at high RPM. At low RPM, you should be able to fill the cylinders reasonably well, but at some point, you just cannot suck anymore through that big long straw, so. So here we have the AU XR6 head. Uh, it is a Tickford item. Uh, there is a big T on the front of it down here. And I've already pulled off two of the valve springs just to make sure that I can, I can actually do it with my tool. It's not ideal, but I have devised a bit of a plan. Today I'm going to strip the head, get these retainers and springs off so I can remove the valves, and I'll uh, go through the process of measuring the port. And hopefully with this episode, we can teach you guys a little bit about uh, the port itself and you know what will limit you and uh, basically what we're looking for and what we're going to do to open this thing up a little bit. What? <laughs> what? I don't know. So she picks up a 10 mil ratchet ring spanner and, and says to me, <laughs> and says to me, this really satisfies me. Like, out of nowhere too. So thankfully that actually fits uh, really nicely over there and I can start winding this in. This has actually compressed the valve spring down and uh, expose the collets here. There we go. Retainer, spring, valve. Hey. 
All right, guys, as you can probably see, the head is here behind me. We've disassembled it, and the only thing left on there basically at the moment is the valve stem seals, which we will pull off. Uh, we're just gonna go through and give it a quick clean uh, so I can show you the ports and we can explain a few things in relation to uh, the size of the ports and what we need to do to reach our goals. Now, if you aren't able to do this yourself, and when I say that, I'm talking about disassembling the head and using the tools I've shown you here. Uh, you can take it to a head shop. They will probably charge you a little bit to get the uh, head disassembled, maybe $50 for a clean. It's not too expensive and it's pretty painless. So we're gonna go through here. We're gonna clean, uh, clean this carbon off. Before I do that though, I'm gonna have a quick look in the port and see what I can see and uh, what we can improve. So one thing that I will be looking at is the is the staining on the port there and that should give you a little bit of an indication of where the fuel is going uh, and when I say that I'm talking about this uh, this staining here behind the valve guide you can see there that that is uh, in some way or another disrupting the fuel flow and I have noticed that there is a bit of a disparity be between the ports uh, not every port is the same or has the same degree of staining there. There are things that can change uh, fuel distribution and uh, one of those things includes the heat. And so the front of the head does look a little bit different to the back of the head as far as fuel distribution, uh, which you shouldn't have too much of an issue with on a fuel injected engine as the uh, injection takes place right at the inlet manifold here, well, right at the inlet of the head here, as you can see uh, there. You see the uh, see the staining on the port here. If we look at cylinder one, well, pretty well any of the cylinders here, and compare it to the cylinder at the back, you can see that it's different. There's actually no staining really in the center here, and it's almost a little bit off to one side here. I'll try and get some light in there to show you what I'm talking about. So what I'm talking about here is the staining in the port here. You can see the injector uh, where it's been spraying fuel here and I'm leaving deposits as well, actually. Um, well, this doesn't occur on cylinder six. And I noticed that uh, the same thing was apparent when you look behind the guide here. I noticed when you look behind the guide here, there's more of a pronounced stain uh, directly behind the valve guide, which we're not seeing on the others here, as you can see. It obviously does look very different to this one. Uh, is this because the head runs hotter? Uh, could be, it's probably likely. Is it distribution? Uh, is is it air, airflow distribution in the manifold? I'm not sure, but it's one of those things that I like to look into and uh, at least talk about it and be cognizant that it is there and it is a thing and we can look into cylinder to cylinder distribution later. So what you will see here guys is a flexible shaft for a Dremel. This is uh, probably Chinese. Um, they do last a little while and they're 30 bucks. So it's a lot better than holding this uh, electric Dremel here, which you can see. Mm -hmm. I uh, will post a link to that in the description and I may post a link to this as well uh, depending on how I feel about it after this job. So uh, what I will try and do is give you guys as much information as you can, as I can and try and add everything uh, and, and consolidate it and give you uh, a package that you can go and purchase yourself trying to make it easy for you guys. Uh, that you won't be buying it from me, you'll be buying it from everyone else. So I'll show you how I'm going to do this. Basically I'll just clean the carbon off these chambers here and you can watch me do it. Oh. And wear a mask. So before I start, I'm just gonna let this soak for 10 minutes while I eat my lunch. A little bit of white spirits. Obviously not trying to wipe it off. This just should help break it up a little bit. Now I am using a very fine wire brush here. Uh, this is not, uh, it's abrasive, but it's not gonna take material off. It's just gonna clean the carbon off. You don't wanna be running any coarse grade metal on anything you don't wanna be cutting metal away from. So this is, this, is, this is quite soft. As you can see, I can move it around my fingers quite easily. This will just take the top layer of carbon off. I'm going to go eat my lunch and then I'll come back after I've washed my hands and have a look at this.
Alright, so now that we've taken most of the carbon off the chambers, uh, I'm going to go through and have a quick look into the port, show you guys uh, what we're looking at here. So as you can probably tell, this is looking from the inlet manifold side of the head, looking down the intake. What you can see in the center here is the valve guide out there. Uh, just provides a bit of extra stability to the valve stem and takes a lot of heat out of the one on the exhaust side. So obviously anything in the port is going to be a restriction. Anything that's in the way of the airflow and obviously this is in the way of the airflow. So what we'll likely do is I'll probably shorten this slightly. We don't want to shorten it too much because you, you want that valve control, uh, especially if we're going to go to a larger valve you do want to uh, retain that valve control and the longer it is, the more stability you're gonna have in your valve train. So, uh, I will shorten slightly and I'll probably put a taper on it. So it'll taper off to a point and that'll just free up a little bit of cross-sectional area because uh, from what I've measured previously, uh, before I clean the port, uh, the, the pinch point or the choke point in this port, is just about here where the valve guide is. So uh, at the moment, doesn't matter how well you port this head, doesn't matter what you do uh, up here, so it doesn't matter what you do with the inlet of the port, if you want to gasket match it or whatever, or the throat, uh, this part here is limiting you and uh, it's basically, from my calculations, 5500, 5600 RPM is where you will run out of flow with a 4 litre engine and uh, that's what we have, 4 litre engine. So uh, we're going to need to open this up in this area and to be honest uh, with what I want to do with this, we're probably going to open the port up slightly. We're going to probably widen the port a little bit, make it a little bit taller as well. Basically, depending on where we go with the valve size, uh, we will look at increasing the size of the port here. This isn't a restriction though. Uh, in most ports, the restriction is, is around the valve guide here or with a short turn radius. Uh, that's where it doesn't like to flow because airflow does not like to turn. And, you know, I mean, you can imagine why. Uh, airflow does have mass, um, it is heavy. Uh, the heavier than you think and it does have a lot of inertia and it does not like going around corners. So uh, what I'll do is I'll measure this here and uh, I will uh, provide you guys with the exact measurements that I get and then I will go through and do some calculations and I'll show you those calculations and how to calculate uh, the correct size for what you want or thereabouts and that way you guys can go ahead and do some porting yourselves and you have a ballpark idea of of what size you need to go to so you're not just hogging it out making it massive because that's not what you want to do uh, everything has to be calculated with these uh, with head porting basically uh, we have some calipers this telescopic bad boy here so i'll go through now and show you how i'm going to measure this uh, pinch point here how i'm going to measure the throat and we'll talk a little bit about the the valve size and how it relates to where the port should be all right so we're looking down into the port here obviously so the valve sits in like this and uh, basically we're gonna take this valve out, like so, and sit it there, and look down into the port. So I'll try and explain to you guys uh, a little bit of port terminology here. You get the valve seat here. Uh, this is obviously where the valve here is. You can see the margin here. Uh, it seals on the valve seat here, and that's what provides uh, the sealing and uh, your compression, basically, uh, when the engine's pumping away. If you don't have a good seal there, um, yeah, you're not going to be making a lot of cylinder pressure, which means no torque, no power. Anyway, so uh, just below the valve seat here, you've got your throat. And you hear a lot of people talking about throat percentages and throat diameter. Uh, this is the throat here, the area immediately below uh, the, the valve seat. And it's very important that you don't just hog this out because if you make this too large, then the air will struggle to come out of the port and don't make the turn, right? So you're gonna have different valve angles here. Uh, so your valve job is gonna have uh, different angles. And if you make this too large, it'll cut into your angles and the air won't be able to make the turn and around the head of the valve. So uh, 85 to 90, 91%, maybe even 92, if you really know what you're doing, uh, percent of the diameter of the head of the valve, as you can see here. So this valve is a 1.85 head diameter which is the diameter of the head across. And this throat here has to be a percentage of that. So we're looking probably around 90%, 91% is it will be our aim uh, for this build. And uh, that's basically so we can get our nice valve angles in here and, and uh, the engine should just like that. <laughs> and it should like that and should be pretty happy there. Uh, yeah, like I said, you start going too much higher and, and the air doesn't want to make the turns. It doesn't want to go around the valve and you, you run into issues that way. Now this factory head I'll measure. So in a second, I'll measure this and I'll tell you guys what the percentage is from the factory. And uh, basically you'll see that there's a lot of improvements that can be made there. Here's the bowl, this is the bowl area. 
There's a lot of different people that will uh, have a lot of different opinions on how big your, val uh, your bowl should be, but you really don't know until you get it on the flow bench. So uh, I do have my own little uh, budget flow bench here. Um, uh, I probably will show it to you guys as I pour it. Uh, it's, it's pretty uh, basic, uh, but it's better than, I guess, pissing in the dark. Uh, so, yeah. Like I said, valve guide from another angle. This is the valve guide. Short turn radius is, short turn radius is this side here. Uh, it's the tightest turn in the port, uh, the tightest radius uh, in the port. So the air, uh, it's, it's sometimes it can be tricky to get the air to make the turn around uh, this this lower port here. And basically, if you mess it up and make it too sharp, or uh, basically. <laughs> You're not going to really know until you, you, you get on the flow bench, but the air can cut across the top of the port. And when air is rushing this direction, air is rushing this direction here, you're going to have a lot of trouble with the air on the top of the port here, which is which is going to be moving uh, pretty nicely, um, getting cut away uh, from this this air crossing it. So uh, you don't want that. So we need to uh, look at this short turn here and get on the flow bench and see what needs doing. Uh, we're not going to do anything too radical. Uh, we'll probably see if we can get a bigger valve in here and enlarge the port a little bit. Uh, get rid of this uh, choke point across here, uh, which I will measure for you in a second. Got the roof of the port up here, and um, basically the, the air, obviously it's coming in. It's going to go around through the bowl, through the throat, through these valve angles here, uh, through the seat and into the chamber. The other thing we're going to look at is de-shrouding. Basically, basically here we're talking about, uh, so when the valve is open like so, um, if I can get that any, I can't get that any further in because the head's sitting down at low lift when the air's coming out, coming out of here and it's trying to rush around this corner here. Uh, some parts of this are probably going to impede a little bit of flow, and uh, more specifically, more specifically on this side here, as you can see, that's going to get pretty close to the edge of the valve here and it's going to cut flow. Uh, so we'll probably have to open this up, but there is a method to this and I will show you when I get around to it. Anyway, so we'll get measuring now and we can provide some mathematical uh, evidence, I guess, uh, as to how much this port uh, can do in factory form and what I want it to do when it's done. All right, so we can use the calipers here, slide these in, I've already made them the right size, uh, basically. I'm gonna slide it into the smallest point here and where it grabs. This is really difficult to do with one hand, um, but I'll try my best. So I hope these measurements be pretty close, but uh, you should probably measure yours yourself anyway. All right, so I can't move that there. So we'll pull this out, I'll measure this, and we'll see what size it is. So it's pretty tricky to do with one hand, but I use this telescopic gauge here to measure the pinch point, which is basically just the uh, perpendicular to where you measured it last time. And uh, we'll measure that. 1.539. So basically we can average these out. From there we'll find the radius and we'll punch it into a calculator and I'll show you guys how to do that. So this is the throat here, and this is what we're going to talk about as far as the percentage of the valve head size or diameter. Uh, basically, I'll measure these two, uh, measure this in both directions here, and then again, I'll average it out. Uh, this is just below the valve seat here, pretty much where the seat joins into the port. All right, so if you look here, we have 1.6085 wide on the throat and 1.6030 high. So again, we'll add these together, find the average, and then we'll divide it by the diameter of the intake valve head here, and that will give us a percentage. So I've done my calculations and it came out to an 86.7% throat, which is 86.7% of the diameter of the valve head. So we're gonna bring that up till it's about 90, 91%. So that, that's gonna give us not only more area, one thing that people may not think about is that uh, if you go a larger valve, that gives you more here because 91% of a, say a 1.93 valve as opposed to 1.85 is going to be a bigger area again. And so a lot of people might say, oh, it's gonna kill your port velocity and this and that. And you know, there may be truth to that, but uh, generally, uh, usually cars go faster with bigger valves and bigger ports and more more valve per cylinder volume. So, so we'll see how we go with that. But at the moment we're at 86.7% and we're going to bring that up to about 90, maybe 91% and uh, see how we go from there with flowing it and uh, kill this choke. So with our calculations here, we averaged the choke point out uh, with the height and the width. Uh, we've got 1.50575. Uh, we punched that into a, uh, punched that into a cross-sectional area calculator and it gave us 1.78 square inches of area. 
And what we can do now is take that 1.78 and put it into another calculator, which will tell us how many RPM that will uh, theoretically support uh, with this size cubic inch. So this next part here is in relation to calculating the throat percentage. So one thing I didn't mention and really overlooked it while I'm trying to make this video is uh, that you need to take into account the valve stem size and the area. And so what I needed to do is I measure it to about seven millimeters. Do the same thing to calculate your uh, your area here. Over here, and uh, you're doing your calculations, you need to take that area away from uh, the throat area here, and uh, which gives us a new uh, percentage of 84.4%, um, and that is your throat percentage now. So don't forget to do that. I nearly did, uh, that'd be silly of me. One advantage these AU, do, AU heads do have over the earlier E-Series head is that the valve stem is considerably smaller. Um, and while some people are a little bit worried about that and they want to spin some high RPM, uh, especially on the exhaust, um, they can go larger, but you know, these will be fine for what we're doing, I think. But the advantage of that is that it takes up less uh, cross-sectional area uh, when you're talking about airflow, because the airflow does have to go past that valve stem as well. Basically, I want the ability to be able to go maybe up to around somewhere between 6,500 and 7,000 RPM with this thing, NA. Uh, which means I'm definitely going to have to increase this choke point and the way I'm going to work out how big I need to go. Back to a calculator here, I can put the RPM in, 7,000, four stroke, calculate, it'll come up with uh, 2.07 square inches. So I know that I need 2.07 square inches of cross-sectional area to get to 7,000 RPM. What I need to do is I need to add the diameter of the valve stem to that now uh, to make that legit. Um, because this isn't accounting for that. So I need to go backwards and work out the, the new uh, diameter of the port here so that I can get, so I can turn that 1.78 into a 2.16. And then that should give me uh, mathematically enough area to support the flow that I need to make 7,000 RPM work. If I don't have it, it's not gonna do it. Your port can flow as nicely as it wants to. For the most part, if, uh, if the air can't get through that choke point, and it's too small, so your engine's sucking through a straw and it's not going to work, and I want it to work, so. So what I'll do, guys, is I'll throw the links to the calculators that I used in the, in the description, and feel free to have a play and see what you would want. See so if you maybe you want to go 6200 RPM and you're happy with that, and uh, you want to keep it nice and reliable, you don't want to be snapping rocker arms, which hopefully we don't do, and you can make the calculations for yourself and have a go and have some fun. Let me know in the comments how you go with that. If you have any questions, hopefully I can help you. If I've messed anything up in my haste, pretty busy at the moment. I'm trying to get a few videos out, uh, basically get ahead because I've got a lot of stuff coming up and uh, I wanna get this build going and a series going so people can apply it to their builds as well. And uh, basically I just wanna drive my car again. So uh, unfortunately the GT is hurt. Uh, it's up on stands at the moment. and uh, It has something going on with the drive line again. Unfortunately, the L34 runs, uh, but unfortunately I don't have rego on it at the moment and uh, it's getting quite expensive because I keep breaking the GT uh, to be putting rego on too many cars. So uh, I probably have too many projects, some may argue that, but you know, that's my life, cars is my life and performance is my passion. So hopefully uh, I can impart some of this knowledge uh, and I am still a beginner in the grand scheme of things. There are a lot of guys out there that I, I really look up to and uh, uh, provide me with a great uh, wealth of knowledge and uh, I just want to be like them, like I'm sure many people do. So uh, hopefully we can learn together and really appreciate you guys watching this. If you have some comments, uh, please drop them in, subscribe if you want to see the next episode. Thanks for watching guys, cheers. And now for the next question. So we've talked about the intake and the length. Uh, now let's talk about exhaust. So when we look at a set of extractors or headers, I would like to know what would benefit low RPM power production as far as an exhaust pipe diameter. So we'll talk about primary pipe diameter, which is the pipe that comes straight off the header before it's first merged. So the primary pipe diameter, small or large, what's better for low RPM or high RPM? You tell me. Leave a comment with your answer. Uh, it's okay to be wrong and uh, 